Welcome everybody to today's Pen AI Tech webinar, uh, the Pen Artificial Intelligence and Technology Collaboratory for Healthy Aging is an initiative funded by the National Institute on Aging. And uh, we are very happy to have with us today as our speaker, Dr. Irene Chen. Uh, Dr. Chen is an assistant professor in UC Berkeley and UCSF's Computational Precision Health Program with a joint appointment in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Her work centers on machine learning methods for improving clinical care and making it more equitable, as well as auditing and addressing bias in algorithmic models. Her work has been published in numerous machine learning conferences and medical journals, and has been also covered by media outlets. She has been named a rising star in EECS by University of California, Berkeley, Harvard, and University of Maryland. Dr. Chen received her PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT and her ABSM in applied math from Harvard. Um, I want to remind all our attendees that you can post any questions you have using the Q&A feature. And at the end of Dr. Chen's talk, we'll have a chance for Q&A and hopefully answer uh, all of your questions. Uh, Dr. Chen, thank you so much for joining us uh, today and I'll hand it over to you. Fantastic. Give me one second as I share screen. We practice this, so hopefully it's all there. All right. Hello, everyone. I am thrilled to be here today um, to discuss some of my research. Um, as uh, George very lovely uh, gave a very lovely intro, I am an assistant professor joint across UC Berkeley and UCSF, as represented by these two pictures, um, as well as some other affiliations as well. All right, so as we deploy more machine learnings in the healthcare setting, we have started to find more egregious examples of algorithmic bias. So although algorithms may be inscrutable, we are getting some more insight into the ways that bias may manifest. For example, on the left-hand side, uh, we find uh, researchers at Stanford have found that dermatology datasets used to train deep learning algorithms that can compete with humans are actually predominantly trained on data from fair skin patients. And in fact, in follow-up work, these researchers found that retraining the model on a data set that includes darker skin patients can improve the algorithmic performance. However, simply adding more data or rebalancing imbalanced data sets is not the only potential reason or solution for bias. On the right-hand side, this is a paper published by some colleagues at Berkeley where they examined care management programs used by insurance companies. Care management refers to the process where companies will use informations, information about enrolled patients um, and determine who needs extra care, how they can manage their care better, uh, usually from support from clinical staff and follow-up visits. However, this algorithm showed racial bias here, evidenced by the differences between the yellow lines and the purple lines, because the label that the model was using to train on was actually cost instead of health need, which has its own embedded systemic disparities as well. Oftentimes, these bias results, uh, at a large scale, oftentimes these bias results um, come from looking at the performance on different subpopulations. In our own work, so we've talked about what it means to have balanced data sets and also to use different labels uh, and better labels for your training, but actually that doesn't always solve the problem. In our own work, this is work from Nature Medicine in 2021, we examined state-of-the-art computer vision algorithms that could take chest x-rays and make diagnosis from them. And we find that these classifiers consistently and selectively underdiagnose different patient subpopulations. In particular, Black women, for example, received worse underdiagnosis rates than compared to other subpopulations. And what this would mean is that as people come into the healthcare system, they might get triaged by a computer-aided uh, diagnosis tool, so a CAD, and maybe the algorithm says, hey, something's really fishy, let's wait for a radiologist, or the algorithm says, hey, you can go home, you know, being here longer is an infection risk. Why don't you, um, you can, nothing's wrong, go home. And what we find is that certain patient subgroups are being told that they have no finding, that everything is okay, uh, just way disproportionate rates and statistically significant ones as well. 
So this is an example here of using a very large data set over hundreds of thousands, over 300,000 um, chest x-rays training the state-of-the-art model. And still we are in, using labels that we are reasonably confident in and still we're finding evidence of bias. My research focuses exactly on these questions of equity and fairness. When we bring in the, that lens into machine learning algorithms, different technical and data challenges can arise. But the first question is why? Why is this so challenging compared to other machine learning tasks? The first, oh, the first answer is that healthcare as it's currently practiced is not equitable. Um, as one example, a very striking example from uh, New York City, uh, which is very close to, to Penn, um, the Black women in New York City have worse rates for maternal morbidities. And this is found nationally, but in fact, researchers in New York City controlled for socioeconomic status, other things they could think of, and similarly found big, big differences in rates for maternal morbidities compared to white women. The data we choose co to collect can also be skewed as well. In a GWAS data sets, so these are genome-wide association data uh, studies, which are prized for how large they are, uh, how representative they might be, how helpful they could be towards population health. Researchers have found that these data sets can have selection bias issues. Um, in 2008, researchers found that 96% of participants in GWAS data sets are of European descent, which does not at all match the global population, for example. Um, the reason that it's important to collect different data sets for different sample sizes, as we saw in the dermatology example earlier, is that different subpopulations can face differences in data distribution. So one classic example of this is that heart attacks present differently for men than for women. Men typically have the more stereotypical chest pains, grabbing at your chest kind of symptoms. And actually women can experience heart attack symptoms as stomach ache or even back pain, which can um, manifest in perhaps seeking treatment at different rates and perhaps the data that we collect about this information. So with a bias existing healthcare system creating biased data, is it any wonder then that algorithmic bias starts to occur? My research focuses on this entire ethical AI in medicine pipeline. And so if there's one thing I want you to take away from today's talk, it's this figure, this idea that although we see and can clearly measure things at the very end, after they're deployed, after they're almost ready to go, um, in fact, a lot of factors come earlier in the pipeline. And so although many of the examples I'll talk today are not specifically related to aging, I think there is a common lesson about how we can rethink where the bias may enter the, the system. Today, I'd like to talk about disease phenotyping. So many diseases, as you may be familiar, are biologically heterogeneous despite a common diagnosis. Things like asthma, autism, heart failure are all diseases that scientists and clinicians are very interested in figuring out how they will develop over time, even though there are known subgroups that may be very different for each other. On the left-hand side, we have asthma, um, which has I th researchers still don't really agree on the different clusters, um, and, and it depends on how inflamed your, your system is and how, which symptoms manifest. Um, in the middle, we have autism. So depending on when it's when the onset is, how it manifests, it might infect uh, it might affect the treatments that are used as well. And then on the right hand side, we have heart failure, which can be separated into systolic and diastolic heart failure. And what I once you start studying, you see it everywhere. But uh, I would I would challenge you to think about the medical settings that you're most passionate about and think about whether or not all the disease, everyone who has that disease manifests the same way, or in fact, are there informally clusters, different types of subtypes of disease that people are more familiar with? Um, and is there a way perhaps that we can think about this computationally, programmatically? So our goal today, thinking about disease phenotyping, is to find phenotyping, subtyping, different types of disease. And, and formally, I guess not formally, but sort of to really state it succinctly and clearly, we are interested in similar patients. Similar patients can manifest in a few different ways, but we'd like it to be useful to design maybe patient treatments, figuring out who should get treated in what way, or to generally understand human health. 
And we could use this understanding then to design clinical trials, to give better patient prognosis, or to be able to segment people into different specialties, different doctors to be able to see. Um, and then lastly, a question very near and dear to my heart, we want to account for any systemic health disparities that might arise that uh, could contaminate the data and create noise in the data that we collect. So today we have about 40 to 45 minutes or eight minutes down, um, but I'd like to talk about two different projects that I've worked on recently, uh, specifically on this task of disease phenotyping, disease progression, um, and, and, and think about how health disparities might interact with some of these, these reasons and how thinking about it through a health disparities lens can improve our understanding of disease phenotyping. First, I'll talk about how we can expand beyond mathematical definitions of fairness and instead build machine learning models to include ideas of equity, specifically differences in access to care. Um, and we'll be looking at example of heart failure in that case. And then second, we will be looking at actually the treatments. How can we figure out who switches treatments and why? Um, and this is paper, a paper that is currently under review. All right, so the first project we're going to look at is how to build algorithms that are, quote, equity aware. So rather than waiting for after a model is built and debugging it, auditing it, you know, coming out with scathing uh, metrics about how it work, doesn't or does or doesn't work for uh, different different subgroups, can we build these principles directly into the algorithm? And this is work done with two collaborators, uh, Rahul Krishnan, who's at University of Toronto, and David Sontag, who is currently at MIT and was my advisor, my PhD advisor. Um, in this part, I'll walk through an example of how to build algorithms that can learn differences in access to care, specifically in the subtyping context. Um, and then we'll also show how the model works on real clinical data gathered from a hospital in downtown Boston. So we oftentimes want to learn from longitudinal observational data. Here we have an example of three patients, patients A, B, and C. Um, and there's only one biomarker that we're really interested in, color-coded here, where lighter means more mild and darker means more severe. And looking at the data, we see that A and B start pretty mild. They have this peach color, and then they start to get more severe. They get darker and darker red. C seems to start pretty severe and actually gets more mild instead in a weird twist. If we wanted to find different types of patients, different subtypes, different phenotypes, we should probably put people who have similar patient profiles together and they can be assigned to the same cluster. A and B would go together and C would probably be on their own different cluster. Um, however, we don't live in an idealized health data setting. In fact, data is often observed only for a known interval. This is known as interval censoring and it can be censored at the beginning or at the end of collection. If it's censored at the end, this is known as right censorship. Um, folks familiar with survival analysis have probably seen this before, but essentially an adverse event, maybe patient mortality, maybe patient leaves the study, patient moves, um, all of these events can remove a patient from data set collection. We'd like to adjust for that. Furthermore, and this I think is a little less studied in the field, left censorship where patients don't come in uh, or we want to figure out what's going at the beginning of a patient trajectory um, is also removed. And this can become, for a variety of reasons, for example, insurance coverage or geographic proximity to hospitals. If you don't have good health insurance, if you don't trust healthcare professionals, if it's an hour drive and very expensive parking in order to see a doctor, maybe you're not going to go in as much and as a result, your data is not gonna be collected. So today um, we are going to develop an algorithm that will actually account for both right censorship and left censorship um, in order to, deter, uh, to take into account the fact that different people have different relationships with the healthcare system. Um, and, and this is a point that I want to emphasize, which is that even if you do not care about equity and fairness, even if it's not something that you really think about day to day, this kind of censorship that manifests because of differences in access to care can create erroneous subtyping if applied naively. So it can lead to inaccurate algorithms, um, even if you're not personally passionate about, about the cause. It is a source of noise and a source of um, error in the data. So how can we learn this disease subtyping? We have a few options. 
first option is we can manually align the subtypes through context clues or domain knowledge about the disease. Maybe we get a clinician to go through and figure out trajectories of these patients. This can be tricky because clinician time is expensive and they might not even know what the true alignment of a person should be. Second option, and this is something that happens more often than not in the machine learning for healthcare community, is that we ignore alignment um, specifically, and maybe we find some somewhat obvious proxy to be able to align everything, every trajectory we want by. Um, let's take a look at what this means. So here we have our, our, our new best friends, patients A, B, and C, and we've actually moved all of the patient trajectories so that they are aligned by the first time that they come into the hospital system. So remember patient A had more unseen data, had a long gray box earlier, but we don't see that. We just scoot everyone over so that their first visit is time equals zero. Patient B, if you remember, had basically no unseen data, so it, they're less affected, and C is somewhere in the between. The problem is if we go through and we cluster these patients, we say, oh, what's going on with the different types of patients in this in the setting based on this alignment? We might naively say, oh, there's three types of patients. There's mild patients, there's moderate patients, and there's severe patients. That is not very helpful. And in fact, it is not very biologically interesting. And it doesn't take into account that, in fact, if we could just slide patient A over, Patient A and B would just slide on top of each other and they should be in fact on the same uh, subtype. So we just walked through a visual example of why option two would not work. We actually evaluate our later method against a similar pipe, uh, baseline in the experiments. So instead we go to option three, which is can we build a statistical model that can disentangle this uh, stage of disease as well as the subtype itself? And so our goal is to be able to model that simultaneously to be able to build a more powerful model. We develop a deep generative model called Subline. This is because it learns the alignment of the patient, meaning how much censorship is involved, as well as the subtype of the disease, meaning which phenotype is involved. Both the alignment and the subtype are assumed continuous for the greatest amount of expression in the model. So on the left-hand side, we have a given graphic, graphic model about how these latent variables of latent structure and alignment time, alignment time is essentially the delayed entry for a specific patient, relate to observed data, these shaded values of the biomarker time that we observe and the biomarker values that we observe. And we'd like to develop a variational inference method to approximate the likelihood here. In the middle, we actually start to think, hmm, when is this problem solvable? Is it in fact possible that there might be times when these clusters are not able to be extracted at all because of how much noise there is in the data? And for that, we need identifiability results. And then lastly, we'd like to show that this algorithm works. So we studied two clinical applications, Parkinson's disease and heart failure. Um, in the case of Parkinson's disease, I think this will probably be more relevant to this audience. Uh, Parkinson's disease, we looked at data from the PPMI, the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative. Um, and specifically, we're looking at how Parkinson's disease progresses over time, given these motor scores, these functionality scores, to be able to determine, hey, if someone comes in at a different time, can we still learn trajectories? And can we still determine different types of Parkinson's disease um, compared to control patients for this, uh, this progression of aging? Similarly, we look at heart failure patients, which, as I mentioned, have known uh, dichotomies in cardiog cardiology uh, between systolic and diastolic heart failure. All right, so that's the model at an overview. Let's dive in. First and foremost, how are we modeling our clinical data? Biomarkers, as I mentioned before, are measurable indicators of disease severity. So we might be interested in measuring glucose, creatinine, or BNP, which is a blood hormone made up made by your heart when pressure builds up. So worse is bad. And we would like our model to be able to handle, handle irregularly sampled multivariate time series. Um, in order to get our data from these quasi-continuous, differently sampled time series into a nice vector format, we z-score it and linearly scale our values within a consistent range where higher is more abnormal. And then we observe up to, uh, excuse me, 
M capital visits, uh, capital M visits for each patient and encode any missing values with NANs. Later we'll marginalize over the NANs, uh, the missing values. So we'll be able to handle any missing values in our data. For, uh, we'd like to learn two latent continuous variables. One is the uh, disease heterogeneity. So you could loosely think of this as the subtype. So although we choose here to use a continuous space for disease heterogeneity, if we if we wanted to find discrete subtypes, so three subtypes, four subtypes, we could just cluster this continuous space at the end as a post hoc step. Um, this will allow for greatest expression while also allowing for interpretability at the end. We also want to learn this latent variable that corrects for the delayed entry. So we're calling it delta, um, and it's the latent alignment term. Remember that A had a large delay, so we think alpha, uh, delta A would be larger than delta B, which corresponds to the delayed entry for patient B. Um, I don't want to get too technical in this presentation, since I know there is a wide range of um, of backgrounds coming to the seminar, but essentially at a high level, we'd like to build a variational inference method that can approximate these data distributions that we're looking for. Um, if you're interested in details, check out our paper, but at a high level, we'd like to build a model to take into account these assumptions and these uh, parametric uh, formula formulations that we've created. And then lastly, we're gonna build our model architecture here at a high level. I'll just mention that we are borrowing heavily from the variational autoencoder setup. And then we are sort of taking our observed times and biomarkers, encoding them into a latent state, and then decoding them back into the same latent, uh, in, into the same observe uh, observations so that we can better understand what's going on in these latent states Z and Delta, which correspond to our disease heterogeneity and our delayed entry Delta as we described above. All right, so that's our, now we have a neural network architecture, now we can train it. Um, oh wait, can we ever actually solve this problem? So this is what mathematicians refer to as identifiability. So here we have our old friends, patients A, B, and C, and we've actually, um, obscured more, we've censored more of the data so that in fact, it may not be possible to discover the correct subtypes. And in fact, we might assign them to different subtypes in a way that is incorrect or just impossible to determine from the original data. So this is a theoretical question about when can we actually solve this problem? Um, and so again, not to bore people with the details here, in the paper we show identifiability under a specific version of this algorithm showing that actually, yes, generally we can solve this problem um, under some assumptions. So we have a theoretical framing here. We have a model that I explained earlier. Um, how can we evaluate what's going on? So we evaluate subline, subtyping, and alignment based on two different metrics. One is based on the subtype, aka the cluster, using the adjusted RAND index. And this measures if they are people, uh, if different people are placed in the same cluster, even if you label the clusters one, two, and three, and then in another formulation, you label them three, two, one, um, they should still be counted as having the same cluster because they correspond even if the labels are different. Um, and then second, we are interested in the alignment. So can we recover this delayed entry value? How accurate is it? Um, we have two metrics based on that. So based on our two metrics or three metrics and two criteria that we're looking for, how well does it do? Although later I'll present clinical findings um, for the synthetic data, I just want to breeze through what we thought about when we uh, were starting to evaluate, hmm, does this seem to work? The first question we had was, maybe it's just because we're using deep learning. You know, maybe it has nothing to do with the alignment. The model actually isn't even learning anything. Um, can we, you know, how do we determine if that's if that's the case? So we built a version of Sublime called sub no line that has no alignment, no delayed entry consideration. It's just deep learning. And we found that for cluster performance, it actually does not do as well. It is statistically significantly worse. Next, we compare it with a greedy approach, um, which is where you just do some clustering and then we fit a loss function. Again, not doing very well. Lastly, oh, second to lastly, penultimately, we compare it against some um, other algorithms that assume cross-sectional data or linear data, uh, pulling from, say, the single cell literature to see if we can learn that. And 
uh, our model, again, outperforms those. And then lastly, we think about the Bayesian community. What if you had stronger assumptions about how this, these da this data would grow over time? Could we learn that? Um, it turns out our model also performs that likely because I think the mo Bayesian model assumptions were too strong. So overall, our model seems to do very well in a synthetic setting where we can control everything, where we know all the clustering and the alignment. We, we seem like we're doing OK. But I, even though I've showed you outstanding synthetic results, we are here for the messy, the technically challenging, the real healthcare data. So working with Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and a longtime collaborator, Dr. Stephen Horn, who's pictured here, our goal is to figure out how these learned subtypes look based on demographic and diagnosis data. So as I mentioned, we're looking at heart failure here. Heart failure subtypes into diastolic and systolic heart failure, which relates to how much the ejection fraction is, uh, meaning how much of the blood that's pumped into the heart can be pumped back out on each beat. Um, a low fraction means that the heart cannot pump much, much blood out. And we'd like to know how our learned subtypes compare against existing subtypes that cardi cardiologists already know about. Um, notably here, we do not have ground truth about subtypes. We do not have ground truth about alignment delayed entry values either. And instead, we'll have to be a bit creative about how we evaluate it. So the first thing we did here was we ran Sublime and we clustered into three, uh, three clusters using this post hoc clustering step. Because heart failure has two subtypes traditionally, we were curious about whether or not we could recover them. And also if there were a third subtype, what that would look like. We evaluated our clustering on features that were not included in the algorithm. So Sublime only looked at echocardiogram values. And here we are collecting these demographic and symptomatic features for these clusters that were not used in the algorithm. We found of 24 that we examined, 11 were statistically significant across the clusters um, with a false discovery correction uh, using an ANOVA test. And we report the cluster means. So you could think of in cluster A, B, and C, they're all roughly equal size, although A is a bit bigger. Um, the average age for the people in cluster A is seems to be 76 versus 75 versus 69. That's sort of how to read this chart. But I find that putting giant tables uh, on screens does not seem to convey a lot to uh, presentation audiences. So let's try to break this down. One of the things that jumps out immediately is that systolic and diastolic heart failure, again, were not given to the model. These are only evaluated afterwards with features that we know about for these, for these patients. Um, we'd like to see if the model seems to be leaning one way or another for these clusters. So in, patient, in, in cluster A, 50% of the patients in cluster A had diastolic heart failure diagnosis, and 9% had systolic heart failure diagnosis. Um, in patient that so that seems that that cluster cluster A is more leaning more diastolic. Similarly, uh, sort of alter or in reverse, cluster C has 53% of those patients have a systolic heart failure plus uh, systolic heart failure. Um, uh, diagnosis, and only 6% have diastolic heart failure, meaning hmm, it seems like that one leans more towards systolic heart failure. And in fact, cluster B seems to be this mixed thing that happens to be a little bit of both, something else is going on entirely. Um, another thing that popped out is that the ratio, uh, two of the features that were statistically significant were gender and obesity status. Women seem to be overrepresented in uh, cluster A, so that one that's referring to diastolic heart failure. Seventy-one percent of those of people in that cluster were women, um, and in fact, in cluster B, sixty-five percent of those patients were obese, which is higher than the other two clusters. Meaning that this mysterious B cluster may in fact be ob obese patients, um, giving us a little bit more insight into maybe a third potential heart failure cluster of importance. And in fact, so we did this study between the years of 2020 and 2022, where it eventually came out. Um, clinical literature, like literally a few years beforehand, was starting to uncover differences in both women in dystolic heart failure, as well as obesity and heart failure. Maybe there's something going on, a third, uh, third subtype is necessary. So this is certainly we're not proving or finding new clinical things, but in the fact that our uh, our findings were validating clinical literature that we could see it in the observational data uh, is very encouraging. And so 
sort of a high level takeaway here is that we can model access to care. We can use a deep generative model to uh, find different disease subtyping, and we can validate known subtypes, uh, recent clinically known subtypes on real world data. All right, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock here, so I'm going to move a little quicker, but people are feel free to dig in, and I know this recording will be available online. Um, the second topic that I'd like to cover is actually about treatment switching. And so here we have a much larger crew of people who came along for this project. Um, thank you to all of them. I will not have time to read them all out. This paper is currently under peer review. Um, so how should we provide treatment to patients? Again, we have our patients A, B, and C. They have different biomarkers. The truth is that the treatment plans can vary for different patients. And in fact, these may have different ramifications for patients as well. So maybe everyone starts on treatment A, which is this blue box, but then patient B gets switched to a different, um, oh, I just realized that it's actually confusing having treatment A, B, and C and patient A, B, and C. Oh, I'll refer to them as colors. Um, patient B gets switched to green uh, treatment. Um, and then the patient C, in fact, also patient uh, blue treatment doesn't seem like it's going very well, and they get switched to patient, uh, sorry, to treatment, to yellow treatment instead. Understanding these treatment switches is incredibly important because we would like to be able to learn from the treatment patterns of previous patients. But the thing is, there are a lot of reasons why patients might switch within classes of medication. Maybe the disease progresses at different rates for them. Maybe there's weird side effects, different adverse events. Maybe there's a patient and or physi physician preference about how they um, prefer, how often they prefer to take a pill versus to take a shot, how big the pill is, if it's um, a, more uncomfortable for the patient to take that medication, um, as well as socioeconomic factors about, say, the cost of the medication. And this kind of information is often locked away um, in clinical notes. It is recorded, it is in the clinical record, but it's often only in the clinical notes. It is not in the structured data. So surprise, this is now a large language model talk. Um, in recent years, maybe the last two years, people have found um, encouraging and lots of potential with large language models. You know, here we have a few uh, different representative studies saying that large language models can help uh, people learn medical education better. It can help uh, f patients feel like responses to medical questions have more empathy, perhaps. Um, and in fact, for low uh, amounts of data, it can be better than zero, uh, be, be better than uh, specialized models because it has some zero shot off the off, off the shelf capacity. And so we would like to actually be able to look at the context of medical medication switching um, using zero shot approaches. And this means that we one wouldn't need to take a specialized model. We don't need to train it on a hospital specific uh, hospital a specific hospital or a specific task and instead we'd like to be able to see just how well these you know so-called amazing large language models can do on a question that we'd be interested in for example figuring out why people switch medications so as an overview we first using the structured tabular data um, identify people who are switching medications. They go from one medication to another. We take all of the clinical notes around the time of their switch, and then we'd like to put them into a um, large language model where we say, hey, here's what's going on. Can you figure out whether or not the medication, um, what is their current medication? What is their previous medication that they, you know, they switch, what did they switch onto? Where are they switching from? And then why are they switching? And then lastly, we'd like to evaluate this both using clinician, um, human clinicians taking a look as well as some automated techniques. And taking a step back, this is actually pretty important because a lot of treatments are often um, switched often. So that was very redundant. Uh, a lot of different treatment classes um, have a lot of switches. So here are several, a list of examples of clinicians and areas that we've considered and are starting to expand this work into. Um, but today we're actually gonna just talk about contraceptives. So about 50 million people in the US uh, use contraceptives and about 70% of the women between ages 15 and 49 are currently on a contraceptive. 46% uh, of women who start a contraceptive will discontinue use within within one year. 
but 76% of those people will resume a new method within three years. And that's really interesting that there's a clear sign that there's a lot of mismatch, people are going back and forth. And if we could better understand that, we could improve patient care and improve and improve understanding of, of the condition that they're going through. This is incredibly important as there's a lot of focus in the global community about the prevalence of STIs and unwanted pregnancies. Um, and for our project, we focus specifically on classes of contraceptives. I know people have differences about even specific oral contraceptives, but for here, we wanted to focus on people who are switching between classes. Um, and for this project, we use the UCSF data set. Um, as I mentioned, I'm currently joint appointed at UCSF. And one of the things I really appreciate about UCSF is that there's a vast trove of multimodal clinical data that has been quite well maintained and de-identified and um, is ready for researchers to be able to dive in and, and dig through. So our cohort, we started with everyone who has ever been listed as using a contraceptive in the EHR, and then we narrowed it all the way down to people who are switching, who have a lot of, uh, and who have associated notes, um, which comes down to about 2,000 patients. When we take a look at these patients, we first thing we do is try to figure out who these people are, what is their demographic, what, what's the demographics going on. As I mentioned, it's hard to read a huge table with a lot of numbers in a presentation, but if we wanted to just find, you know, hone in on a specific, a specific set of rows, one of the things we first noticed was that there's a large difference in race between patients who are happy with their first contraceptive and patients who end up switching to a different contraceptive. And we see that 45% of white patients um, never switch compared to say only 14% of Latino and, uh, Latino and Latina patients as well. This is sort of very interesting to us and so sort of motivated us to dive, dive a little deeper and see what's going on. Next, we try different prompting methods. Um, in the interest of time, I'll probably gloss through these a little bit, but we did try pretty extensive prompt tuning uh, methods for those who are, have experimented with large language models. Prompt engineering is thought to be um, a way that we can elicit much better or much worse performance for a specific task. So it's important to try a lot of different prompting methods. Unfortunately, in our experience, we found that all of these prompts methods uh, yielded basically the same results. So for us, prompt tuning, uh, prompt engineering did not seem to be very helpful. Um, and here we're looking at whether or not uh, the algorithm could extract new medications very well, and if the algorithm could extract previous medications very well. Um, and they are all about the same. We also did a bit of uh, token string matching, string token matching to see um, if there was a fuzzy match. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this too much other than to say that it did not seem like it actually matched up with some of our other evaluation methods. Um, we also compared against what happens if you use less training data compared to more training data to see if our large language model could, could help with that. Um, and it appears that our model, the large language model is roughly equal to only using about 30% of the training data. So this is encouraging in that if you don't have a lot of data, a large language model could help. But if you have a lot of data, say if we used 100% of our data, this dotted line um, shows that a lot of the other models can start to outperform the performance. Um, and then similarly with another task, which is finding the previous medication. So that's a lot of results, but I wanted to focus on sort of some high level ones right here. One is that we wanted to eventually ask a clinician we have some great clinical collaborators and we'd like to, them to be able to label, does this model seem like it's working? So we asked them a different clinicians, here's what the model said, here's the exact note, is the explanation for stopping correct? Um, and we found that the explanation was seemed to be correct most of the time, 80% um, of the time. This is on GPT 3.5, we're currently running results for GPT 4, um, and then was there any hallucination? As people may know, models may just make up information. It's not that they're wrong, it's that they're completely deranged and are, seem to be bringing in information that is not even part of the question. And it seemed like there was not as much hallucination, although some concerning amount there. Um, and then the last thing we looked at, so we are ultimately interested in, can these models learn different reasons? And so we used topic modeling, leveraging embedded uh, contextual embeddings from BERT to be able to figure out what the actual topics used in these, um, in these reasons were. 
here are a list of some of the topics we found. Ultimately, we the number of topics was chosen based on the um, this uh, this HBD scan HDB scan method. Um, so the topic number of topics is chosen dynamically by this algorithm. Um, and here are some examples of topics that came up. So let's break this down. One, we have some topics that are related to the fact that people forget to take their pills. Um, so this is related to patient preference. Patients, it's not, the delivery mechanism is not really working for them. Um, there also are some uh, example, there are some reasoning about different IUDs expiring and the placement through these IUD specific topics. There are also a lot of topics related to symptoms. So regular bleeding, nausea, weight gain, uh, came up multiple times and in many different topics in many different ways. And so this relates to clinical effects of the patient and how that treatment might affect the patient as well. And then lastly, and sort of really interesting to our, in the context of this health equity question, insurance and the cost of healthcare, uh, specifically for contraceptives, was a big reason for people to choose to stop or switch uh, treatments, um, which became really interesting as well. Um, here are some other topics. I don't want to go over it too long, um, but to suffice to say, it was pretty comprehensive and very interesting to read through all the topics of why people choose to switch. Then we stratified the topics, these topic enrichment values by the different races. So to recall, Black, Latinx, and multi-race um, patients seem to switch contraceptives more often. And so if we could figure out if certain reasons were um, affecting those groups more, that would actually give us more, uh, that would help us understand why it seems like they're switching. And in fact, to zero in on one, uh, one column here, topic eight, insurance coverage, ended up having a higher enrichment. So more red means more prevalent for those groups for Latinx, Black, and multi-race patients compared to um, Asian, white, and other patients. So this is starting to give us a little a sense into existing health disparities in reasons behind treatment switching that is perhaps not super well known, but we can start to unlock this using large language models. Um, yep. So in recap, this is ongoing. Uh, this is sort of part of the work is under peer review right now, and we're continuing the work as well, essentially showing that we can leverage large language models in a zero shot setting, meaning we don't have any existing data about this task. Um, then the extracted reasons, including, including many things, including insurance coverage, which I think is an understudied component for machine learning for health folks like me. And these findings could have downstream impact on how we extract treatment protocols from electronic health records um, in the future. So today I've showed two different examples of ways we can think about how diseases are different and how treatments for diseases are different um, and how we should build more equitable algorithms that take those into account. But I wanna take a step back and think about this question. If, all, if algorithms were used more in medicine, so, more AI, more machine learning, would the biased and unfair treatment based on patient's race or ethnicity, meaning just bias in medicine, would it get better? Would it stay about the same or would it get worse? Some of the examples I showed today were about how machine learning could help us better understand things, but also some of the examples I showed today showed that you know there's big egregious things that we need to keep in mind going forward. And so I was really curious about this question when I came across it precisely because the Pew Research Center asked a bunch of Americans how they feel about this, whether or not they think bias in AI will get, bias in medicine will get better, stay the same or get worse. And 51% said they thought that AI would make it better in medicine because humans are biased and AI is neutral. I would say based on today's talk, that is not entirely true, but it is possible that we could use machine learning to improve equity in healthcare. Um, and we are on our way to do that as well. About 33% said that it would stay about the same. Um, this is because people training or data are all biased and therefore you are getting, getting about the same that you put in. That's a reasonable argument. And then 15% said it'll get worse. So AI is trained on existing data sets, which are already biased by the humans who made them. Um, and I think that is sort of what we, was reflected in how I opened the talk, thinking about bias audits and the ways that those can manifest as well. So today, 
I've walked through two specific examples of how to rethink how we build algorithms for disease phenotyping, for treatment phenotyping, um, and how to think through uh, how to incorporate this in the ethical and AI in medicine pipeline. I, I really strongly urge everyone here to really consider all the steps. We only covered a few today, but um, it's important. It's important to think of things beyond bias audits, which receive the bulk of the news coverage, but are in fact only one piece and really only the end of a very long pipeline. So I encourage everyone to examine the entire pipeline. How, how does that feed into your research questions and can you move upstream? Secondly, I want to encourage people to frame equity questions as potentially computational challenges. Certainly questions of equity are systemic and relate to society and power structures and many different components, but they also manifest computationally, thinking about label noise, missing data, patient trajectory alignment. How would that affect your model as well? Computationally, what are the effects we see of bias? And then lastly, all of this has to be patient-centered how a model will be deployed, how will the model be used, what are the factors that will actually be taken into account and how will it affect, uh, you know, and how could it go wrong for anyone? Um, and I'd like to sort of end thinking about at the end of the day, patients, clinicians, normal people, your grandmother, all people will be affected by algorithms. How can we make sure that they're built for everyone? Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I think uh, it gave us a lot to think about. Um, and I want to remind our attendees that uh, you can uh, use the Q&A feature to post questions you have for the speaker um, uh, or use the chat room. But I would say just use the Q&A um, link on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And while folks are doing that, maybe I'll start first by, with a question. Um, you mentioned the use of large language models, and that's something that we've been um, thinking about a lot within Pen AI Tech in terms of uh, the bias, as you mentioned, that can be in some cases exacerbated based on um, the input. And there's all these um, uh, studies now that show bias even with uh, image generators and uh, um, recognizing that we have a lot of uh, bodies of text and images with um, with bias. So I was wondering if you could talk more about how you see for the next five to 10 years, the role of large language models when it comes to their use in clinical practice. It's a great question. And I'll be honest that I think we are all figuring this out as we, you know, we're building the plane as we fly it. Large language models represent a huge amount of promise. As I mentioned in this talk, they can mine through a lot of unstructured data. They don't need a lot of training because they come out of the box pretty powerful. Um, and they can distribute power. They can enable people to better understand health conditions as well. On the other hand, they are inherently inscrutable. They are very, um, they're concentrated in the hands of only a few people who control these algorithms and who are interested in uh, developing them, perhaps not for purposes of equity explicitly. And they are pretty expensive to access and run. So I think looking forward, there are a lot of different components we'd be, have to keep an eye on. Um, in the context of medicine, I would urge everyone to use them for cases where people are going to be able to evaluate them afterwards. It is uh, incredibly clear to us at UCSF that having large language models, you know, unfiltered, doing diagnosis, giving out treatments, et cetera, is a non-starter. And both for performance reasons and for li liability accountability reasons. I would encourage the community also to be a little bit of creative about how you could use large language models. Are there ways we could, um, I just saw a paper about how they rewrote the surgical consent form using a large language model. So it's more readable. It's a sixth grade level as opposed to a 12th grade level. Um, and I think that represents sort of an example of, you know, it doesn't have to replace the doctor entirely, but perhaps it could all help all of our lives get a little better and also improve equity if done carefully and very selectively. Thank you. There's several questions um, uh, from our attendees. I'll start with one of them. Going back to your point about subtype versus disease stage, how can we account for a phenomenon like chronotropic incompetence when the longer a patient has been sick, 
the less likely they are to exhibit compensatory symptoms like tachycardia? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. My understanding is that as patients get sicker, um, the disease progresses in many different ways. Um, and that can be related to treatment. It can be related to other components of um, the, the decompensation. And for that, I would say each different trajectory a patient can take becomes a different subtype. And so we see that even patients who get one treatment versus another treatment just become two different subtypes, even though I frame the talk here as, you know, oh, asthma can just manifest in different ways. Asthma treated and untreated are in fact two different subtypes on their own. And so we can define the type, the type, the phenotype of the patient broadly, not strictly biologically, um, and can in fact relate more to the systemic body um, uh, representation. Uh, another question is how important is upstream data collection in the homes or everyday lives of target populations? We are starting to examine more data modalities, thinking about things like wearables, or even if you have like an Alexa in your house, thinking about how maybe you could give your mood to the Alexa. People are starting to use to mine social media data to think about your mental state. It is um, exciting in some ways and also scary in other ways. So I think uh, studies have shown that people who use Fitbit data, people who are represented in those Fitbit data sets are not representative of the entire population, going back to my example about GWAS data sets. In that case, we can learn some things about some people, but we should be very careful to not make extrapolations to the entire patient data set. And then it when, and then when necessary, um, spend the effort and the resources to be able to collect data uh, for a wider range of people as well. Um, there is a related question in terms of patient-generated data. In some cases, persons are compared to self-generated baseline. What are your thoughts about more or less bias there? An example might be finding urinary tract infections. Some people use the toilet more frequently than others, so simple monitoring of toilet use would not work. That is also, these are really thoughtful, thoughtful questions. I think in the end, we have to use the data that we have. And it's unlikely we can force people to use the restroom more. We, can for, we can't force everyone to use the restroom at the same rate. And so, when we work with longitudinal observational data, not prospective data, not clinical trials, one of the inherent challenges is this measurement bias about the data that we get to see. Taking all of that into account, being clear about when we what we know we don't know versus we don't know we don't know um, becomes even more important. And so it, I think all of those it's almost like everything we put up has like a little asterisk. You know, it's a very long discussion, a uh, paragraph in the discussion section of a paper saying these are the limitations we used. You know, we this is the data that we collected, and this is how it goes. And these are this is where we would expect our results to extrapolate, and this is where we'd be less sure. Um, from your UCSF work, can you conclude that the nodes in the EHR system are reliable? We find the notes to be decently reliable. The question, I suppose, is reliable compared to what? Um, if we had someone who followed the person around all day, that would be more reliable than them coming into the hospital uh, some you know irregularly at, at best, maybe once a year. I've also worked with uh, teams of nurses who call patients. And so that's a sort of different data set of proactive outreach and thinking about when you should direct nurses and who you should direct nurses to um, to call and thinking about if there are gaps in the data that we think or we think the data is unreliable, could we go about doing that? Most of the unreliability I find in the CSF notes tend to be people taking bad notes, tend to be people copy and pasting previous notes into their new notes, tend to be misspellings, tend to be um, people using abbreviations that are non-standard. And for those things, LLMs tend to be pretty good at that. Um, so I would say that there are, again, potential promise and also perhaps peril. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have another comment. It's not a question, but a big thank you. This was an excellent presentation, uh, says one of our attendees. And I want to add my uh, 
uh, second that and say thank you so much for this great presentation. We have a question about our national symposium, which I will answer separately uh, and want to remind folks that we do have our national symposium, the second annual symposium for the A2 Collective, uh, March 19th and the 20th um, here in Philadelphia. And uh, you can find more information uh, on our website. Um, and also remind folks that the recording of this webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel and you will be receiving the link uh, a few days uh, um, later, uh, hopefully by early next week. Uh, so with that, I want to thank Dr. Chen again for this wonderful presentation and thank you all for attending. All right, thank you everyone. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. All right, bye.